about to Great Day Houston. We're at the Smith Clinic focusing on breast cancer and the latest treatments to address it. It used to be a time when breast cancer was just it, right? But what we know through research today is that there can be different types of breast cancer and breast cancer can act differently in different people. Joining us now is Dr. Maryam Namati Shafi. Good morning. Good morning. All right, so that was a big breakthrough to realize that there are different types of breast cancer and it can have a different kind of fingerprint in each person. Yes, absolutely. So the way we see breast cancer and treat it these days have, has come a long way. So we know now that since the late 1980s to now the uh, mortality from breast cancer has consistently reduced. And some of that is due to um, screening, early diagnosis, as well as better treatments. And um, the focus now is to even come up with better treatments that are more targeted and more specific for different cancer types. Um, there are some terms we're going to throw out here that people who have been through treatment certainly understand, others might not. But um, for example, non-invasive uh, cancer. So it, it, w any kind of cancer can be bad, but when it's non-invasive, that gives you kind of a head start. Right. So for example, we have ductal carcinoma and lobular carcinoma, you know, the ducts and the lobules I was just talking about, um, in situ, which means they're right there in situ. They have not gone out of the milk duct. And um, so the treatments for each of those is different. Mm -hmm. So we think that uh, essentially for patients who have DCIS, they have about, you know, 5% five five chance of developing invasive cancer over the next 10 years. And with LCIS, lobular carcinoma in situ, it's about 1% a year. There are things like lumpectomies, um, mm -hmm. a mastectomy, so I may just elect to have the, the whole breast removed, and then the hormonal therapy that you talked about, kind of keep things uh, balanced out. Now, when it's invasive, this means you got to get a little bit more aggressive about treatment. Definitely. So the approach changes. So when it is invasive, we look at uh, what's called uh, markers. So uh, we look at estrogen receptor. That means that the estrogen in the body is helping the cancer grow. Mm -hmm. If the cancer have estrogen receptor in it, it's po testing positive for estrogen receptor, that means that the estrogen is making it grow. So we would like to reduce estrogen, hoping to take it essentially out of the circulation so that the cancer would, would not be growing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the next one is HER2. So the HER2, which is a human epidermal growth factor receptor, uh, it is essentially a molecule that has, or you can say, uh, kind of two parts. Uh, one part extends out of the surface of the cell of the cancer, and then there is one part inside. So that tells the cancer cell, now go ahead and divide and grow. And what we can do is to block that with an antibody. So um, we have currently in practice uh, two kinds of antibodies present, the Herceptin, Trastuzumab, and Pergeta Pertuzumab, that's supposed to block this molecule so the cancer wouldn't grow, and that's considered targeted therapy. I feel like I just went to medical school, partly. <laughs> All right. Uh, the, the other one that we, we started hearing more about over the, the past several years, and that is the inflammatory breast cancer. This one acts differently, and this one can be pretty serious. So it's about 1% of all breast cancers. So breasts can look essentially uh, red, hot, swollen, inflamed. Uh, it may be hard to tell it apart from mastitis, which is just infection of the breast. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of times women are usually treated with antibiotics, one, two, or three courses of antibiotics. So they miss the diagnosis improve. of cancer. It can present to us a little bit later than what we like it to. Yeah because it is an aggressive kind of presentation and uh, early diagnosis is very, very important. All right, there are different stages of cancer that we hear about. Stage four is the one that I think a lot of people fear, but uh, it is not hopeless. No, absolutely not. Over here at Harris Health, we, we have about six to seven percent of our patients with breast cancer are stage four. And uh, we, there are a multitude of therapies available. So if the tumor has one of those markers that I was talking to you about, the estrogen receptor or HER2, we have uh, treatments that are specific for those. And if it doesn't have any of those, which we call triple negative breast cancer, there are chemotherapies available. And of course, the field is changing. Um, there are a lot of therapies that are currently tested and some of them that are recently proved that are targeted as well in triple negative breast cancer that we can use. So it can be like a, a less collateral damage, if you will, but not everything has to be chemo and radiation anymore. Oh, no, absolutely not. All right, breast cancer we talk about mostly in women, but it can happen in men as well. From every 100 patients that's diagnosed with breast cancer, about one 
uh, is a man. And that's a surprise to a lot of people. I do have a friend who's a man who uh, breast cancer ran very strong in his family. Mm. So it was really kind of not that big of a surprise when he was diagnosed. The treatments is relatively similar to how we treat breast cancer in women with subtle differences. Yeah, there are a lot of folks who, um, when it came down to, to treating breast cancer, the thing that we'd love to do is basically prevent it if we could. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and you know, we talk about healthy lifestyle and all that type of stuff, but what got our attention were a number of celebrities who had that BRCA gene who just said, you know what, nothing's presenting right now, I'm just going to go ahead and remove all the breast tissue. Is that something that's truly viable for a lot of women where they feel like it's not if but when cancer will present itself? With BRCA1, BRCA2 especially, if there is family history of breast and ovarian cancer, then we do recommend for women to have bilateral mastectomy as well as to remove the ovary as a, uh, because there is a very significant risk of ovarian cancer with these mutations. All right, yeah. if we can look into a crystal ball where are you going to be X number of years from now and your hope of how we can deal with breast cancer? Prevention is really important. So our diagnostic tools are improving. So mammograms are in wide use right now. Um, and the mammographic techniques are also improving. So there used to be two dimensional mammograms. Now we have three dimensional mammograms. So a lot of times we have MRIs. And that's why and it's important to even do trials and things, right? Oh, clinical trials are very, very important. Um, a lot of times with clinical trials, people think about stage four, metastatic, and the stage cancer. Now, what else is available out there? And of course, that's very important because um, so only three to five percent of all cancer patients end up going on a clinical trial, which are um, essentially uh, intended to improve the way we treat cancer. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, diagnose cancer and improve quality of life as well. In fact, those uh, clinical, clinical trials, trials are yeah. kind of what kind of set the groundwork for a lot of the protocol that we have today. So it's kind of research, you kind of think something might be working, and with a clinical trial you can prove that something is working. Yeah, absolutely. So clinical trials are very rigorous, and they're very, um, we have very uh, highly specific uh, guidelines on how they should be done, which I cannot say it was always the case. Yeah. It wasn't. Absolutely. Dr. Mm -hmm. Damati Shafi, thank you for being on the front lines of fighting breast cancer. Thank you. When we come back, when your hair starts to fall out, it might be time to wig out.